Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Rachel Alexander, and I'm the Deputy Director at New America, California. New America is a think and action tank based in Washington, DC. New America, California's efforts center on economic equity and community voice, and how people with lived expertise can drive policy and system change on the issues most important to them. Thanks so much for tuning into our webinar today. We're talking about Latinx economic resilience in the time of COVID. This is our ninth online conversation since April. Others have focused on issues like COVID's impact on Black communities and how we can support women-owned small businesses during the pandemic. I'm incredibly grateful to all of our speakers for joining us today, and particularly to our moderators, Cecilia Munoz and Hector Mujica. Hector, a huge thank you to you and to Google.org for your partnership and for co-leading this conversation. And Cecilia, thank you for your years of leadership on issues of racial equity and for agreeing to moderate this series. I'm gonna hand it off to you to get us started. Thank you so much, Rachel, and thank you for your wonderful work at New America, California. I'm very lucky to be Rachel's colleague and very honored to be uh, co-moderating this um, amazing panel with Hector. Um, so I'm going to just start by um, introducing the panelists um, and setting the stage a little bit and then we're going to get right into the conversation, but we will have time at the end for questions from the audience. So we're hopeful that you will think about what you want to ask. Um, you can use the uh, chat or Q&A functions to ask your questions. Um, we're interested in having as much of a conversation as possible. This is an, an extraordinarily important time in our country. It's an extraordinarily important time for our community. Um, you know, you will hear what the data shows about the impact of the virus and the disparate impact of the virus uh, on uh, the, the Latino community. You'll also hear about the disparate impact of the economic fallout from the vi virus in our community. Um, I was looking a week or two ago, ago at data that came from the Brookings Institution that looked at specific age cohorts of Americans and found that uh, Hispanic Americans were more likely to be sick than any, to get sick with this virus than any other group. African Americans more likely to die than any other group of the virus. And sometimes the death rate within the people of the same age group was as high as 10 times the rate of whites for African Americans and eight times for some age court cohorts uh, among Latinos compared to white Americans. Those are devastating numbers. We're feeling the impact of that in our community, which makes this a tremendously important time um, to be having this conversation and it makes us tremendously fortunate to have these leaders with us. So I'm going to introduce them to you and then ask them a question just to get us started. You've already met Hector Mujica, who's my co-moderator. He is the Director of Economic Opportunity in the Americas for Google.org and our co-host for this event. Um, you also have Frankie Miranda, who is the President of the Hispanic Federation. Uh, Professor Manuel Pastor, who is the director, director of Equity, the Equity Research Institute at USC. And I'll just point out that Dr. Pastor is going to have to leave about a half hour before we're done. So any questions you want to tee up for him, we want to make sure we get to first. Uh, and then Janet Murguia of Unidos US, which is the largest Latino advocacy and policy organization in the country. So thank you all for taking the time to join us. Uh, Janet, I introduced you last, but let me turn to you first just to answer just this is a, the, the, the two minute intro question. Can you just kind of tell us the story of what you as a person, as a leader and your organization and your affiliates in particular are dealing with right now? Of course. Uh, thank you, Cecilia. It's wonderful to be part of this discussion with this distinguished group of panelists, people, individuals who I respect immensely. So including yourself, Cecilia. Thank you for the invite. Look, uh, we're dealing with an unprecedented crisis, uh, uh, unprecedented moment uh, for the country, but in particular for the Latino community. And we're seeing exactly what you've already hinted at, uh, that the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 uh, uh, is playing in our community is really devastating, both as it relates to the health impact and to the economic impact. I know we're gonna get into that a little bit more. I would just say uh, more than anything else as an organization, we've been shifting our work uh, to be able to be effective and as effective as we possibly can be in meeting our response to this by working remotely. You know, we as an organization 
have about 150 staff. Uh, our headquarters has been here in Washington, D.C., where I'm uh, talking to you from. But we have regional offices, and we have 150 staff who, on a dime, literally had to uh, learn quickly how we could communicate uh, I'm grateful uh, for the investments that we were able to make in the last couple of years into technology. So we found ourselves with some strong uh, technological supports that allowed us to be able to be communicating across digital platforms, probably more readily than we would have been two years ago. Uh, so I'm grateful for that. And of course, uh, admire very much the efforts by and commitment by our staff to make it work. Many of them, as you all know, if you're listening here, are working in more crowded spaces perhaps than most. You're working from home perhaps with children or perhaps maybe uh, you're caring for a parent. All of our staff have found a way thus far to make it work. And so I'm very grateful to them. I've been working as uh, secured in place with my husband, Maudel, and he has a full-time job and is running an agency, the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. Uh, and we're trying to manage two very uh, uh, busy agendas within our respective work roles and try to stay out of each other's way, but at the same time function at a high level. So uh, we're obviously very mindful of our mission. Uh, happy to go deeper into that as we talk about the direct challenges as it relates to health and the economic uh, impact on our community. But for now, I'll leave it there. Thank you so much, Janet. Manuel, how about you? How are you? And, and how uh, is this affecting you and your work and the things that you care about? Well, certainly like uh, Janet, I've learned to work remotely. You can see my lovely uh, home office. I had to buy a Shoji screen because when I first started broadcasting from my office, you can see my closet and everybody kept asking, how many black shirts can one human being actually own? Uh, the answer, of course, to that is infinite number of black shirts. They're all very different shades. Um, so we've moved our staff remotely, as she said. And I just want to kind of lift up maybe uh, two things uh, about the moment. Um, about a week or a week and a half after there was the declaration of the stay-at-home order here in California, so that was March 13th, it's been two weeks. Um, we had uh, done an analysis of who we thought was especially vulnerable to COVID and where we thought this disease was likely to go heading forward. It's a disease that started with people who either were traveling internationally or had contact with international travelers. So here in Los Angeles, that was mostly people on the west side wealthier, whiter communities. But it was pretty clear if you started looking at the data about who was in essential work, who was riding mass transit, uh, who was living in overcrowded conditions, and actually also who was undocumented. Because here in Los Angeles County, 18% of our population is either themselves undocumented or living with an undocumented family member, and in the absence of any kind of relief, have had to go scrounging to go find some work, that this is a disease we predicted two weeks after it started was gonna rip its way through the immigrant Latino community. And normally academics really like when we can say, I told you so, I feel pained by the fact that I'm able to say, we told you so, but we didn't put the safeguards in place to put the testing in these immigrant communities, in these communities of color, to recognize the vulnerabilities that existed. So the space I'm in is a little bit pained about that, but then also trying to stay busy because we are in an extraordinary moment, which I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about later. There's a saying that um, there are decades when nothing happens, and then there are weeks when decades happen. And I think we've been through those weeks where what the COVID crisis did was reveal the systematic vulnerability, precarity of employment, uh, structural racism in the society. That unveiling got sharpened in terms of its vision with the murder of George Floyd 
and the attention that's being paid to policing and now that's a tip of a racist iceberg in terms of inequalities in the economy, education, and the environment. And all of that has come on the heels of three and a half years of our community being brutalized by this regime that currently exists in DC. So there is this huge moment to have people's consciousness raised for things to break open and do something about it. So I feel a lot of pain, but I also feel a lot of hope about what is possible in this moment. Thank you so much, Manuel. Frankie, how about you? How are you? And how is this affecting you and your life and your work? Hi, Cecilia, Hector, Janet, and Professor Pastor. Um, thank you for the invitation. And um, uh, I think that I have a, a, a very unique perspective on, on this uh, sit on our current situation because um, although I've been at the Federation for many years, I actually, you know, uh, became president of the Hispanic Federation starting in January. And one of the biggest decisions that I have to make a uh, few weeks later is whether or not we needed to shut down our offices in New York, our headquarters in New York. I was just like, uh, what is my board is going to say? Uh, I am starting my job and I'm just basically trying to just figure out what exactly is this emergency and how is it going to affect uh, our staff in New York. And um, when you start hearing from um, uh, rumors that the subway system in New York City is maybe shutting down or that the largest school system in the country is looking at shutting down, you know that something serious is coming your way. So um, we started uh, very early uh, before the entire city and the state started shutting down. The Federation was able to quickly move into doing an assessment of our technology and being able to uh, start working remotely. It was something that, as Janice said, we were investing in before, but we didn't know if we were going to ever going to pull the trigger on having the entire team in several states working remotely. And um, soon after we were able to secure our team, make sure that everybody was safe, that everybody was somehow connected, we realized all the challenges. Uh, we realized how many of us were having uh, decent uh, broadband. Uh, that we were able to have the technology, uh, we were able to function uh, at, at different uh, levels in, from our homes. And then we started looking at how about our member agencies? These are the community, the organizations, the grassroots organizations that are working in communities, they are employers, they're serving uh, the most vulnerable of our communities and they were completely forgotten by most of the response of government and many other sectors. So we realized very quickly that if we were having uh, some sort of issue trying to transition, uh, what about our members? So um, in the meantime, we also realized that New York was becoming the uh, epicenter of this epidemic very quickly. I live next to a hospital and when I started seeing the refrigerated uh, storage unit, the first one coming in, the second one coming in, three refrigerated units, uh, trucks uh, storing uh, people passing from this disease, we realized this is very serious. We started hearing from our member agencies that uh, people were dying in their apartments, members of our community, because they were afraid to go to uh, the hospital or to go to a testing site because members uh, uh, people in uniform were helping put together these, these sites and they're afraid, as Professor Pastor mentioned, of the toxic narrative that has been created around our community. Depending on the zip code that you live, especially in New York City, and that was the, test, the horrible test ground, our neighborhoods were the ones with the highest rate of infection, the highest rate of unemployment, the higher rates of deaths. And um, it, is, it has been very difficult six months, um, very difficult for us, but we have seen that when you put science and you put uh, the right uh, response, 
Uh, we were celebrating this week that we had zero deaths in 24 hours. It is, it is uh, for us when we were having rates of deaths, mostly from people of color uh, in the hundreds. Uh, this is uh, an example that New York, we, we all believed that New York was going to be the example for the rest of the country and that our pain was going to serve for something. And unfortunately, that's not happening. So uh, we are continue to work and create uh, uh, ways to support our communities and our member agencies. And I will be more than happy to talk a little bit more about it a little bit later. Cecilia, if I could just build on that a couple more minutes. Sure. Uh, in terms of, you know, Frankie and Hispanic Federation talked about member agencies. You know, our structure is to support a national network of community-based organizations that have served our community and others for many years. And uh, we felt it was important to offer immediate support uh, for those affiliates of ours all over the country to respond. But as Frankie mentioned, one important gap that immediately surfaced was for our own community and our affiliates to get information, not just in English, but also in Spanish. And that was a huge gap. We immediately put up uh, a website that was both uh, not just our English language website, but in Spanish to provide critical information in real time. So having bilingual uh, information was one immediate need that was not met by the federal government or many state agencies. Uh, so that was really important. But secondly, for us, as with uh, Frankie, we felt it was important to provide support to our affiliates who were in turn turning around and supporting the community needs, both on the healthcare front, and we're fortunate to have some key uh, centers that provide health services that don't ask questions about status and do everything they can to provide that support in English and Spanish, have cultural competencies. So that could be Urban Health Plan in New York City. It could be Mary Center in Washington, D.C., CMAR in Washington State, AltaMed in California, Alivio Medical Center in Chicago. Those organizations became a critical safety net to provide health services to everyone who needed it, and that meant treatment as well as testing. But more importantly, to su provide supports for those community-based organizations to be able to do their work remotely immediately because they needed to be also taking care of their staffs and not all of them were able to make investments in technology to do that. So we set up the Esperanza Hope Fund to make sure that we could draw on some resources to turn around and support those affiliates to be able to continue their services and their supportive communities in a bilingual and culturally uh, you know, relevant way and to make sure that our community was getting important information, but also what we were seeing because of the economic impact, a lot of folks just needed access to food and uh, some direct assistance as it related to uh, cash. And so we had a number of our folks, uh, maybe it's Central Campesino in Florida, helping the Homestead farm worker community get information, get assistance. Perhaps it was, he got in Alabama getting information to those folks who might not have a broader support network in the South, uh, but Conexion in Nashville and Hika in Alabama to do that. Uh, we were also seeing uh, responses by Mujeres Latinas in Acción in Chicago because sadly in this environment that is such high stress, we saw an uptick in domestic violence and getting information. So. There's an array of services that we continue to support through our affiliate network and these community-based organizations that had to sort of change the way they are providing services, the need for technology to do that work remotely, and then to actually provide assistance on an immediate basis to our families. You know, I think Cecilia is gonna find out too, and really need to ask us many questions. Uh, but I, in keeping with that spirit, talking about working remotely, I do want to point out one really important thing, which is 
the existing internet inequality, which has been also revealed by this. So again, some statistics from LA County that we calculated early on. Uh, for students who are in K-12, who were sent home and expected to do remote learning, many analysts define the digital divide as lacking in your household, uh, high-speed internet and a device like a laptop or a computer instead of just a handheld device. Um, by that measure of the digital divide, 13% of white kids in LA County went home on the wrong side of the digital divide, but it was 35% of black kids and 39% of Latino kids. Now, schools made a big effort to hand out hotspots and Chromebooks and the like, but that level of digital disconnection has meant that there's a really permanent cutback or uh, retraso setback in terms of the learning of these children. And it's exacerbated by the fact that you've got many kids who are in ESL programs, their parents can't necessarily help with their homework, particularly if they're monolingual Spanish and really counting on what happens in schools to make a difference. So this, uh, you know, while a lot of our agencies and many of us were able to go to relatively high speed internet, my internet was working until my musician son moved in with me and those young people use a lot of bandwidth. So we had to like really amp it up. Uh, but for folks who've got no connections at all, this is a really serious issue. And it's one that a lot of professional middle-class people are not in touch with as a daily lived experience of digital disconnection. Indeed, indeed. So what you're really seeing is a community that's already facing enormous challenges and frankly, a safety net infrastructure that's been built by the community that's being challenged in a way that we've never we've never seen before. Um, so thank you. I'm going to pass the microphone, as it were, to Hector. But before you start asking questions, Hector, you too tell us, like, how are you? How is this affecting you uh, and your work and the things that you care about? Thanks, Cecilia. Well, first of all, thank you, Janet, Manuel, Frankie. Thank you for the work you, got, you all are doing. I think these times. Uh, have been incredib incredibly difficult for all of us and very complex for all of us to navigate. Um, and each of you are an inspiring leader in our community and we really look up to the, the work you guys were doing. Um, you know, I think we've been trying to, I've been trying to navigate this personally and it's been complex, right? I, we were talking about this prior to the call uh, coming live about how it's a mix of frustration and anger and at times some hopelessness, but we got to stay determined and fixated on, on uh, the light at the end of the tunnel. And we got to, we got to stay fixated on the ability and the capacity and the privilege that all of us as leaders in the Latino community have to be able to leverage our organizations or resources that they have accordingly to, to be able to support some of these folks that are falling through the cracks. And um, I commend each of you for the work that you're doing to, to lead in that, in that direction. It's, um, it's a pleasure to be moderating this, co-moderating this with, with Cecilia and to be in this dialogue with, with all of you, um, all of you that have been on a quest for social justice day in and day out for so, so many years. And, um, and like, uh, like we've all acknowledged that by, by this point, the work that all of you guys are doing is more important today than ever before, particularly when it comes to building economic resilience in the Latino community in a post or mid COVID-19 pandemic economy and in the context of racial reckoning that America is undergoing right now. So I do wanna ask, Professor Pastor in a minute to set the stage for us a little bit more focused and centered on economic opportunity and some of the trends and challenges that we're seeing there. But uh, I want to underline a couple of points first. Uh, there's um, one point that I want to acknowledge is that nearly two thirds of all new jobs created since 2010 require either high or medium level digital skills for them to be able to participate in those roles. Um, that's why Google.org has been investing since 2017 over $200 million to increase access to economic opportunity for communities around the world, including the Latino community, including with groups like Unidos and the Hispanic Federation. So we're so glad to be, be supporting the work that you guys were doing. Uh, we also know that COVID-19 has accelerated the need for 
the workforce to acquire digital skills. Like we've acknowledged in the earlier part of this conversation, most of us, all of us are currently working from home. That's also a luxury and a privilege that we all have. And uh, as a result of this crisis, we know that nearly one, one third, one in three businesses, small businesses, say they will rely more heavily in digital tools for their operations. And that's going to require their employee base to also be more adept and acquainted with digital skills and digital tools. So as we solve for these, acknowledging the fact, as you guys have all called out, that we need to be responsive to the immediate needs of the community, whether it be cash and putting food on the table, whether it be internet and the connectivity divide. Um, we also need to be looking out towards the long-term employment needs, uh, access to a more, to more recession resilient skills and jobs uh, for the future. So within that framing and kind of centering us and centering the conversation on the themes of equity, access, opportunity, and the intersection of these with technology and the digital economy, Professor Pastor, I would love to ask you to kind of set the stage for us. As an academic, what are you seeing in terms of historic trends over the last few years, few months, in terms of Latinos and the access to economic opportunity? And how do those trends, how have those trends either been disrupted or augmented or amplified by COVID-19? Uh, well, thanks for the really simple question, Hector. I have to, you know, uh, so let me say a couple uh, things maybe five big trends to kind of pay attention to. One is uh, there's an enormous shift going on right now in terms of the way we think about the economy, which I think is gonna be really critical. Uh, and that is that we tend to think about the economy in terms of people pursuing their individual self-interest in the market or the government kind of needing to play a role taming that. I think there's a couple of important lessons coming from the current crisis. Number one, there cannot be a robust private sector without a robust public sector. Unless we solve the public health problem, we do not have a space for private enterprise to be able to succeed. And the kind of traditional counterposing of the state versus the market, private versus public, never made sense to me. It's clear it doesn't make sense right now. Second, we've begun to realize that the way that we protect ourselves is by protecting everyone else. If you don't have everybody else with health insurance, you're gonna get a pandemic that spreads broadly. If you haven't got unemployment insurance and income cushions that are actually available for everyone, they're gonna be forced to go back to work. And when they go back to work, they're gonna wind up creating a danger for everyone. So we're beginning to realize that if we really wanna protect ourselves, we need to protect everyone. And that means things that would be good for the Latino community, universal access to healthcare, uh, universal basic income, uh, universal uh, training, etc. The third big philosophical thing we're learning is that our fundamental principle needs to be mutuality. And it's really interesting. If you ask any successful business, including yours, uh, Google, uh, how you became successful, it's not by trying to rip off consumers. It's not by trying to exploit workers. That's a really short-term way to go. It's by treating your customers right, treating your employees right, and treating your suppliers right. You only succeed if mutuality is your norm. And we have organized an economy based on competition versus mutuality. We need to fundamentally rethink how we do things. We've been calling that solidarity economics. How do we act in solidarity with one another? Then there are, and I'll do this quickly, four big trends that we need to pay attention to. Number one, the expansion of care work. We are an aging society. We are going to have more need for elder care. We're gonna have more need for health care. And for example, in California, where I reside, the number of jobs in home care is going up faster than the number of jobs in high tech because we're aging and we need care. Uh, second, the move to remote work is actually gonna have a really significant uh, deleterious effect on commercial space in a way that will impact all those little small businesses that operate around office buildings and feed into those folks. And a lot of those small businesses owned by folks of color, uh, staffed by people of color. Uh, third big 
trend here, the hospitality and tourism industry are gonna be permanently damaged in ways that people don't realize. Partly, it's what's going on right now, but it's also, if you're in another country, why would you go and visit the most mismanaged country, perhaps with the exception of Brazil, on the planet Earth? Uh, we in California have had a big benefit from Asian tourists who now understand that we are dangerous. Um, and I think this is gonna have a huge impact on industries where a lot of Latinos work. Last thing I'll say that's really important is about young people. And I bet Frankie, who looks like he might be the youngest of us, uh, <laughs> but that's just your good looks, Frankie, um, that uh, understands this, which is that when young people come into a labor market in a recession, they are permanently damaged in terms of their wage trajectory for the rest of their life. And for millennials, they entered the labor market during the Great Recession. They've had their wings clipped by the COVID crisis. Their ability to uh, access wealth, own houses, be successful is really problematic. And uh, you know those youth are disproportionately Black, Latino, and Asian. So it's got a racial element to it as well. And it means that issues like forgiving college debt coming up with new mechanisms for people to be able to get the assets to buy houses or start businesses as young people is incredibly crucial to repair the generational damage that's being done right now by a boomer generation that's living living in Ohio, Medicare and Social Security hog and all of the benefits of previous loan programs while this new generation is being starved of the resources that they need to succeed. And that's a generational issue and it's a racial issue. And we should be lifting it up because Latinos are disproportionately young. And what we do about this generation's success is incredibly important for the Latino community writ large. Thank you. Thank you for setting the stage for us on, on that. And I want to I wanna pick up on the second kind of trend that you mentioned around move to remote work, uh, what that, the impact that's going to have on commercial spaces, and then the, by extension, the impact that's going to have on small businesses. And Janet, I want to look to you for, for this one. Um, we know that small businesses are the backbone of, of many economies, including our economy, and they're a key pillar of the Latino uh, wealth generation uh, capacity. We know that Unidos recently did a, did a poll with Color of Change and found that nearly half of Black and Latinx small business owners who are still in business will likely need to close their doors by the end of the year. Mm -hmm. These businesses are, you know, they're employers, they're anchors of economic stability in our communities. What are the cracks in the U.S. economy that COVID has exposed when it comes to minority owned SMBs, Latino owned SMBs, and what must be done to support these SMBs build back better, more resilient in the new economy? Yes, thank you, um, Hector, and appreciate Manuel's overarching uh, trends. Just before I get into the small business piece, I would just say one of the takeaways from Manuel's comments, I would say from Professor Pastor's comments, is that um, you know public policy making will never be more important for us as a Latino community, and we're going to all have to really think about how we're engaging more effectively in advocacy at the local, state, and national level because we won't solve this problem merely with the private sector and a robust private sector. It's going to require us changing uh, policies going into the future. Uh, Hector, to get to your po point, it is true that we did this joint survey with Color of Change and Unidos US, and that our survey found out that half of Black and Latinx businesses would have to shutter their doors within six months uh, because of the dramatic impact economically that they were feeling from these closures that uh, Professor Pastor pointed out, not just short term, but could have longer term effects. But it's important to remember what they said in that survey. And they said that without help, this would be devastating and continue to be this, uh, would continue to have that. But despite this need, um, I would say to you that Latinos and other communities of color have yet to receive targeted assistance in any of the stimulus packages that have been meaningful. According uh, to the poll, 
only 12% reported receiving the full amount that they requested from uh, the, the PPP program, the relief program that was established, despite the fact that 60%, that's six zero, 60 percent of Latinx small business owners apply for less than $20,000 in assistance. We're not seeing the response uh, at the federal level or frankly at the state and local level. Our own affiliates uh, that I referenced are also small businesses. We need to think about the nonprofit sector being represented here. And Frankie understands this at Hispanic Federation. And according to an internal survey of our own affiliates, only 31% of our affiliates have been approved for that Paycheck Protection Program uh, loans, although 82% of them applied for the program. So, uh, so far, we're still seeing a lack of response, but it's also why we're pushing, and I know Hispanic Federation is in that fight as well, very hard for the Senate to take up the House Passed Heroes Act that has targeted funding uh, for minority-owned small businesses as well as other relief uh, for communities that were left out originally in the CARES Act and other stimulus packages. We have to continue to advocate for this relief in, at the federal level. And frankly, the HEROES Act, which was passed by the House, has a number of provisions that would be effective in helping our small businesses, our nonprofits, and other uh, families, mixed status families, that have not received that relief to date. So a call to action would be to have any of the folks participating as viewers on this uh, particular uh, uh, panel uh, to contact their senators and demand that they act on the HEROES Act and take up the stimulus provisions that were represented in that HEROES Act that will help our community. Thanks, Janet. Yeah, and I really appreciate you you making that distinction that the half of small businesses closing their doors by the end of the year will, will only happen without intervention, and intervention is possible, and it's, uh, it's really up to us to hold our elected officials accountable for, for those type of interventions that benefit our communities. Um, Frankie, I want to slightly, not entirely shift gears, but kind of looking at it on the flip side. So we have SMVs as wealth generators as employers in, in our community. When we're looking at employees and we're looking at individual Latinos that we also know have been disproportionately impacted by unemployment as a result of COVID. When it comes to unemployment, we're looking at low wage part-time female minority workers being the most affected and most likely con to continue to be impacted by further displacements as a result of the economic downturn. This also happens to be the same group, uh, going back to Professor Pastor's point earlier on how we did, that these injustices build up on themselves, this happens to be the same group that often lacks digital skills or access to skills. We know that Latino workers of any race make up about 14% of the overall workforce, but represent about 35% of workers with no digital skills, 20% of those with limited uh, digital skills, what must be done to ensure greater access to adequate workforce development programs that prepare a community for the digital economy of tomorrow? Um, I think that the simple solution is more targeted investment. Uh, we knew that before this pandemic, only uh, less than 2% of philanthropic dollars were going to Latino-led organizations or Latino-serving organizations. So we have already uh, working with uh, our sisters' organizations around the nation, uh, uh, Unidos US, uh, and also other uh, incredibly uh, uh, incredible corporate citizens, uh, Google.org, to try to bring to light the fact that Latinos need to, uh, or, or organizations that are providing workforce development programs to Latinos need to incorporate these new digital skills. Uh, in, in different uh, states, in different cities, there are different, kind, different programs that in many cases have not really kept up with the, kept up with the uh, new technologies or the new advancements that needed to be added to uh, these curriculums. Um, 
our mission at the Federation is to provide capacity building to nonprofit organizations. That's what we were created 30 years ago, and that is what we keep uh, advocating for because these organizations are amazing. Um, uh, uh, Janet affiliates, Hispanic Federation member agencies, they're doing the incredible work in our communities, but they just need, they are under resource and they're underfunded. So by collaborating with Google.org, we have been able to select 24 organizations around the country providing uh, workforce development programs and making sure that they do an assessment and look at what they're offering and how they can improve on those digital skills. Now, this is pre-COVID. Now that we are talking about a new world in COVID-19, we have been collaborating with them and assessing their new needs. And for example, we just need to start thinking about the same way that we transition into teleworking, what is going to be the new needs for these uh, uh, participants? Uh, for example, uh, instead of creating computer labs, now we need to think about a way that they can, we can loan computers to these participants. And in that also, it's looking at what are their realities. If you live in a zip code that does not have broadband, adequate broadband, how can you actually do teleworking or you can do remote learning? So this is about going back to uh, Janet's point and um, Professor Pastor's point in terms of public policy. This is the time when we were working for the last two years and a half uh, in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria, uh, Irma and Maria in Puerto Rico, we knew that uh, unless we put pressure on the federal government, this administration was not going to provide the equitable or justice to all the American citizens that happen to live in the island of Puerto Rico. Let's think about for a moment about this, right? This is about an administration that is denying help to people in Puerto Rico. So what did we decide to do is to provide nonprofit organizations with the, the funds in Puerto Rico to be able to provide the solutions during the most extreme circumstances that you can face, no electricity, no water, no food, no anything. And they have been able to do that. We can do that here. We need to reimagine the way that we think about jobs, that we think about training. And while it is uh, really difficult because circumstances are changing every single week. Uh, and uh, we have 50 homegrown solutions for a national problem, which is our pandemic. Um, I think that the, our sector can provide these solutions and can, can provide also the necessary information to uh, be able to move forward and also provide these services for our communities. So I'd like to just draw your attention to the um, chat function for folks who know how to access it. Um, there's quite a good conversation happening about housing and crowded conditions and the impact of that on families. And, um, and uh, Dr. Pastora has already answered one question, but also some of you are answering each other's questions, which is kind of awesome to see. Um, there's a, a, a remark in response to the uh, question about crowded housing and how you get people into safety um, of a couple of places in Massachusetts that are using hotels to quarantine residents who aren't able to isolate. Um, so I just want to draw your attention to that. And then it's a little earlier than we were planning to go to audience questions, but there's some really terrific ones that are coming up. So let me just pose one that's come um, from, a, um, from a participant that's focusing on this extraordinary moment of elevating the Black Lives Matter movement, which I know is something that, that our panelists have participated in. Um, uh, the question is that our African-American leaders have been able to increase investment in startups and venture funds. What would your call be to call to action be for the Latinx community so that we can also increase funding and opportunities in the tech and innovation space? That's open to anybody. So Cecilia, can you repeat that last part? I'm sorry, it faded out on me. So what would your call to action be to increase investment in our community, particularly when it comes to tech, when it comes to innovation, and I would just add maybe entrepreneurship? Um, well, I would like to highlight investments that uh, we have leveraged from partners um, 
like Google, and I appreciate Hector being part of this conversation because I think, well, everyone has uh, more to do in this space. I really appreciate the efforts that uh, Google has made to invest uh, in uh, preparing our community for those future workforce opportunities. Uh, one area where we've been involved in is uh, called the Casa Code Project. And uh, we've been working to develop a toolkit that's targeted at Latino students and their families to better expose them to STEM learning and encourage them uh, to consider getting into the tech field. Uh, and not to mention uh, the fact that, uh, you know, we're already what I would call beta testing the toolkit uh, for a public release next spring, but I think I can identify some of the best practices for reaching the Latino community, and that is that the toolkit is first culturally competent, meaning it's it's bilingual and produced with a Latino audience in mind. We know from our work and experience that just these cookie cutter approaches just won't work, uh, and we're involving parents and families. Some of some models that we're building on are our Padres Comprometidos uh, model, which is a parent involvement program. And, you know, training parents how to become more effectively engaged in their children's education uh, to layer on top of that, this sort of tech uh, layer and helping parents and families encourage their children to access STEM education and a career path in tech jobs is, is uh, really important, but there's an important service aspect to this CASA code project as well. And, and we're teaching many of our students and participants how technology can improve their neighborhoods and their communities. And so uh, that public service lens can be a great motivator for our young people. And I know it's a little bit of a stretch, but our young people, as we know, are very colorblind. They're working across communities of color to engage each other already. And so I do think there's an opportunity when we think about the shared challenges that we have as black and brown communities to leverage the work we can do together in this space and making sure our young people are leading the way. If we can give them a lot of the resources through programs like Casa Code, a lot of them are already developing approaches that are very multiracial and multi-ethnic and at the same time preparing work pathways for them into the field of technology that's just one example but obviously a lot more work to be done as we leverage uh, more funding i believe for stem programs not just from the private sector but from the public sector it's just going to have to happen we won't get there alone with just a, a, a corporate investments. It's gonna require both. Cecilia, if I may add to what Janet so, so well put, put together uh, th this response, I just think that also I would like to add that the, the, the models exist. Uh, Unidos have the models. Many of our agencies have the models. Well, we need to just start talking about going back to the public policy and demand that right now with this, in the middle of this emergency, the emergency response needs to reflect the faces of the pandemic. What we have seen over and over and over again is that investments are being made, big announcements are being made, commitments are being made, but the reality is that they are not reflecting the communities mostly affected. So there is an opportunity, the models exist, uh, it is working in many of our communities, but how do we ensure that everybody, that we just don't check a box and we just continue giving and doing philanthropy or community investments in the same way pre-COVID? It is time to look at this. And at the end of the day, we just need to try to find a collaborative effort, as Janet mentioned, because at the end of the day, 
uh, when we talk about uh, Latinos uh, or, or or black and brown communities, at the end of the day, we actually have sometimes to compete for the same funding resource, for the limited funding resource. That should not be the case. At this time, we need to start thinking about a more collaborative approach, and we need to just we have already the the models to promote, and we just need to think about investments in a different way. Uh, Professor Pastor mentioned that already, but I want to emphasize that we cannot continue doing this the same way that it was done pre-COVID. So I'll just add a couple things real quick. One, a uh, couple places where I think uh, the private sector could lead with some support from the uh, public sector as well. The first is to recognize something very fundamental about high tech which is that behind every software engineer is an army of nannies and gardeners and food service workers. And every place where there's a cluster of high tech, there's a cluster of service workers, janitors, et cetera, whose working conditions and wages are uh, not sufficient to be able to uh, buy a house, uh, help a family survive. And any responsible high tech leader needs to understand that even as you drive the top of the industry, you need to lift the bottom that's around you. So high tech should be strongly in favor of an increase in the minimum wage, should be strongly in favor of universal uh, health insurance, should be strongly in favor about equity and education spending, recognizing that the ecosystem being constructed around high tech includes these other workers as well. Second thing uh, that I think high tech can, 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 uh, can lead on is the digital access. And understanding that digital access is not just about laying out a pipe to a community, but making sure that there's lifeline programs so that people who have low incomes can actually afford the access that's being brought into their community, that they are equipped with the kinds of uh, laptops and other kinds of uh, 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 mechanisms that you need to access the internet in a high quality way, not simply trying to do your homework by typing a paper in on your parents' phone. Um, and that the high tech industry, you know, Google has a great program of giving your folks a day off to be able to invent something. How about a day off for them to be digital core going to communities doing training around how to uh, use these tools, particularly for uh, older folks. Last thing I would say is we need to be thinking about how to steer venture capital and not simply in the direction of app development, but also of content creation. Because of course, the sort of newest wave uh, in technology is how do we fill up all of these tubes uh, with actually stuff that people want to watch. And any people that have been able to come up with J Balvin and Bad Bunny in the same like you know, period of five years, that's fucking content creation. Pardon my French. Um, <laughs> and, you know, it is a, the way reggaeton has blended cultures and captured the imagination, not just of Latinos, but of the nation. The underinvestment in content creation by Latinos, that's a space where people come and then they wind up learning the technology to be able to do the content creation. And I think, uh, working with Hollywood and understanding content creation and getting venture capital into those spaces would be very important. Thank you. That was super helpful. And I know, Professor Pastor, you're going to have to drop uh, in just about five minutes. So maybe I'll pose a question to you that, um, that I'm hoping to also ask Frankie and Janet at the end of, of our session. So we'll have a little bit of time to think about this one. But um, one of my closing questions that I would love to, that I want to hear you reflect on right now is given the, the incredibly difficult and complex time that we're all navigating right now, and given your role as a leader and as, as like an academic in the Latino community, what is one sentiment that you can leave our audience with um, that will help us focus in the light at the end of the tunnel, however faint that light may seem at any given point in time? Boy, you're asking academics to make just one point. I mean, God, Hector, that's that's almost brutal. <laughs> um, so I'll uh, I'll make uh, 
two, if you don't mind. Uh, the first is um, a lot of my life, like a lot of many of folks, has been uh, trying to deal with crises in communities, trying to figure out how to address them. And I was always struck by, I worked in, I did political work too in Los Angeles in the 90s when our city blew up uh, around the issue of police violence, but actually also around the issue of economic desperation, which is part of the reason why about half of the people arrested during the LA civil unrest were actually Latino. Uh, and it was a minority of the people arrested were black um, because it was as much about economic deprivation as about racist policing. And many of us were kind of going from meeting to meeting, thinking if we went to one more meeting, we'd actually solve things. You know, uh, some of you may be doing this right now. Um, but in the middle of one of those meetings, someone leaned back and said, there's an immediate need to think long term. And I always hang on to that because even though this is a crisis moment, the stuff we need to do around uh, ensuring that immigrants uh, attain a path to citizenship, assuring that we make investments in our schools that are equitable, ensuring that technology gets to all communities, ensuring that we combat racism and respect difference, those are just fundamental long-term principles and thinking about what the long-term agenda is and not just the agenda of desperation is really critical. In that regard, my second point is that we need to understand that there is no contradiction between the need right now to center the struggle against anti-Black racism and promote Latino and multicultural alliances. We live in a society in which its original sin, of course, was the taking of land and genocide, but it compounded that original sin with, you know, America was quite original, uh, with the sin of slavery and asset stripping. Asset stripping of labor, and then after reconstruction, asset stripping of land, and then asset stripping through our financial systems and the ability of people to buy stuff. Uh, and we've created a systematic uh, anti-Black racism that has set the contours for the othering of other groups, Latinos, immigrants, Asians. And so we as Latinos need to step up in this struggle for Black Lives Matter and the struggle against anti-Black racism, understand that it is our struggle too, and that there's no contradiction between embracing that as a central theme and urgent need, particularly in this moment, and at the same time saying, we do need to develop multicultural alliances and we need to make sure that the Latino story is also being told. A Latino story of challenges, but also a Latino story of assets and creativity and hope. And that's what I would leave you on. I'll hang on for five minutes that I've got because I really want to hear how everybody else answers this question. Can I just build on that? Uh, if I can, uh, I would just say that uh, um, as I hear Professor Pastor talking, I'm reminded of the letter that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. wrote to Cesar Chavez while he was fasting during one of the boycotts. And in that letter, uh, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, our separate struggles are really one, a struggle for freedom, for dignity, and for humanity. And to me, it's a reminder today that that's still true. And that, um, as we say in Espanol, tu lucha es mi lucha. Your fight is my fight. And until we address this original sin that has created these systemic inequalities uh, for people of color, but in particular for Black uh, people, we will not see the reforms that we need to see, the changes, not just in attitudes, but in policies that are gonna drive a future for all of us. And so I just couldn't agree more uh, with 
what uh, Professor Pastor has said. And I know that there is still some who are struggling with this and we should be honest about that. But for me, and Cecilia may have an appreciation for this, a lot of people have asked about why NCLR, the National Council of La Raza, changed its name. And a lot of the early information that we received as we approached our 50th anniversary, and we're looking at our milestone moment two years ago, reflected that we needed to be very clear about our inclusive nature and understanding that we had a mission that needed to include everyone. And our name before didn't necessarily convey that, especially to younger uh, Latinos and Latinas. And so for us, it's very important that we embrace this notion that we had to end systemic racism as it relates to the Black community for us as a Latino community to benefit as we move forward into the future. So a couple of comments um, to just note. So participant Josue Revolorio points out, also reminds us about the genocide against Native American people. Obviously, that's also one of the stains of our history that affects our present. And then uh, Andres Cuervo asks, can any of you speak to the challenges and needs of the Afro-Latinx community in this moment? This is a segment of our community that's often left behind, and he wonders how we can do a better job of including them in our efforts of recovery and resiliency. Well, so, the, Frankie, do you want to yeah, dive in? Yes, I, I, I really appreciate the, the, the comment because the reality is that when we talk about uh, joining these fights for racial equity, uh, for us Latinos, uh, it is, there is, there should be no question about our support to this struggle because we uh, come from a very complex history also of colonialism and slavery and uh, genocide in many of our countries of origin. And when we arrive here in the United States, it's even compounded with a, a system, a, a different system that we quite don't understand in many cases. And there has been definitely uh, uh, Afro-Latinos have been in many ways invisible in our own countries of origin. And the way that we are portrayed, that we are talked about, the images that we see in the media are always, we are celebrating culture, Afro-Latino culture, uh, salsa, we see Celia Cruz and we celebrate it, but we erase it from many other parts of our culture. And it's important that while we reflect about this social justice issue, that we continue incorporating Afro-Latinos and our mixed background into this conversation to really understand how we can more effectively uh, advance this conversation. Uh, Janet and I and many other colleagues join a call for action for, our, for the media and, and basically include more representations of Afro-Latinos and just show the richness of our uh, diversity and our community. So um, I want to always say when people say like, is there is a problem with racism in the Latino community, I always respond, we have a lot of work to do, but we are not the enemy. We are, uh, as much as I revisit the literature and documentaries about African-American black leaders since the 1960s, they always talk about black and brown. We have been there in that struggle from the very beginning. And when we get divided, it's only because sometimes members of our community has to go to, the, to compete for the limited housing, for the limited res health resources, or for the limited uh, educational resources that are out there and that gives the impression that we are not working together but the reality is that we are in this fight because we're fighting for the same the same goals and the same uh, aspirations I'm gonna go ahead and say goodbye although well, it's a very rich conversation right now to which I would just add uh, people bring racism and colorism from the countries from which we came but arriving in the United States is not destined to beat the racism out of you. Um, in fact, it's destined to put a whole other level of racism and competition. And the struggles to forge a new 
mob people of color framework and black brown unity are incredibly important. Thank you so much for having me with you today. Thanks, Dr. Pastor. Hector, over you. Can I, can I just add something, Please. Hector, real quick? Because I do think, hey, look, we could spend hours, uh, and it's a very real issue, talking about identity. And we as a Latino community are changing back to how we, what we saw as we led up to our name change. Not only as a Latino community are we changing the demographics of this country, but within our Latino community, we saw uh, what is leading now to this latest statistic that at least 25% of our Latino community identifies as Afro-Latino. We marry outside of our community more than any other race or ethnicity. Identity is a real issue. But I'd like to bring back, if I could, because Cecilia, New America has been working on an issue related to data and data collection. And again, this all gets sort of mixed up and I would welcome your comments before we open up to more questions on this, but let's reset on how COVID has impacted from a health perspective, at least our community. All of the statistics that we're seeing are based on available data. That's critically important because it's not complete and it's disconnected. But even based on available data shows the devastating disproportionate impact that Latinos are feeling as a result of the COVID crisis. But we know that that data is incomplete. There was a recent Washington Post story that also pointed to the fact that federal and local governments and hospitals all count race and ethnicity differently. We're but yet policy decisions and resource decisions are made on where we need to provide that kind of assistance most urgently. But if we're not collecting that data in an accurate or correct way, we're going to see our community yet again disadvantaged. Uh, and that's a layer on top of the systemic inequities that we're seeing play out. So I know New America has been helping and we're partnering on some of these fronts, but uh, Cecilia, you've got a lot of expertise on this now. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? I think it's so important for our audience to hear about this right now. Well, thank, thank you, Janet. And you're absolutely right. And I saw that piece. It was written by Jose Rico on um, re related From to, Chicago. Oh, yeah, thank you. Related mm -hmm. to um, what we don't know, um, and what we can't quantify about the impact of the virus itself on our community. And there are huge problems with the way healthcare data is collected at the local level. It's not standardized. And then it gets reported up to the CDC. And then there are delays in how the information comes back. So you don't, we don't have as much real-time capacity to address challenges like the one that we're facing in real time. And that's something, obviously, that, that the cost of that is incalculably huge. And our communities are paying the price for that. At the same time, New America has been looking at the data with respect to the economic response and with respect to um, the, the, what, what Congress has done through the CARES Act to try to get money uh, into the pockets of people who need it. You talked about the PPP program and the extent to which nonprofit organizations and small businesses and entrepreneurs have been able to access that money. And there are huge disparities there. It's also true that the individuals who are trying to access that money face obstacles. We've been able to document tens of millions of people who have not gotten their stimulus check. Um, in some cases, because they, um, they don't earn enough money to file for taxes. And so the pipeline that Congress chose to get the money back to them doesn't exist. And then we uncovered the fact that the, the IRS's workaround to get those dollars to people who aren't in that pipeline created a new obstacle. So now they can access the stimulus money, but they can't access the earned income tax credit. Um, now that's a, I think that was an unintended impact. I hope it was an unintended impact, but it was an impact that nobody knew until we figured it out. And we figured it out simply by going around and talking to service providers like the affiliates of Unidos, like the member organizations of the Hispanic Federation who are in there in the community with people and they know what people are going through. They know 
how they live their lives and how that affects how they're able to access the resources that Congress intended to make available. That's leaving aside the question of the big chunk of our community that Congress did not intend to benefit, right? The undocumented folks who are not eligible for services under the CARES Act and their family members who can't access it either. So it, it becomes incredibly important for us as leaders, as organizations, as advocates to make sure that whatever data exists that we have access to it so that can, we can begin to quantify what's going on in our community and that we insist when it comes to healthcare, when it comes to other issues, um, that data be collected, that we actually be counted and visible so that we can highlight where there are disparities. I mean, Janet, your, your point is an excellent advertisement for the importance of the census, which is I know, uh, which I know is something all, that all of you are working on. Hector, over to you. Thanks, Cecilia, and thanks for the, the great points, uh, Janet, Frankie. Another question that we got from the audience that I think is tangentially uh, tied to this topic that we're talking about in policy making, policy building, is the following. Um, when there is a change in administration in November, what do you think should be two or three economic policy priorities that our community should unite under to demand of the new administration? I'll open that one up to either of you. Go ahead, Janet. Go ahead. <laughs> well, first I would just say um, two things. I want to make sure I pick up on the point that um, uh, Cecilia made, and that is in terms of call to actions, we have to make sure everyone participates in the census. And there are still a lot of efforts underway to make sure that that information is fully collected. So I want to, and I know, again, we've been part of coalitions with Hispanic Federation, Unidos and others, to uh, Naleo, to make sure that that happens. That information, again, uh, is the starting point for how we can continue to build on policies and resources. So that's important. To get to this point, if there is a new administration, a reminder between now and November, people have to register to vote and they actually have to go out and vote. So uh, we have efforts underway to register at Unidos US. Please go to our website, our Adelante campaign, Hispanic Federation, others have many efforts targeted to our community to make sure we're registering our Latino voters and that they are mobilized to vote on election day. And by the way, that we're fighting any voter suppression efforts that are occurring in an increasingly growing fashion in different parts of the country and nationally. So that's so important and we can't just blow by all of this and assume that we will have a new administration. We don't know that, we have to fight uh, for our community to be engaged and involved in the election and electoral process. But let's assume hypothetically that we do have a new administration. There are gonna be so many competing interests uh, for this new administration to respond to. But I do think that first and foremost, uh, it is important to acknowledge that we're still, in all likelihood, going to be dealing with the effects of a pandemic until we have a vaccine that we know will begin to start to address this issue. We have to make sure that our community is uh, ad addressed in terms of the needs from a health perspective and economic perspective. So. One is to make sure that we're uh, getting care to our community and the policies are in place, but let's assume we have a vaccine. Again, once we have a vaccine, we have to determine who's gonna be prioritized and who receives that vaccine. That's gonna be so important. And right now, I don't feel like it's getting very much attention. Uh, I think Speaker Pelosi has raised it and talked about it in terms of the HEROES Act. But there's going to be a commission that's probably going to be established to determine how do we decide who gets that. It's going to be very important for us to make sure that our community's needs and interests are addressed there, both from a health perspective. And then I think there are going to be policies, and we have lists of them, to make sure that economically, I mean, someone raised, we have an affiliate network that's very involved in all of these issues, but the housing needs Right now, we're trying to make sure that in, again, something that was passed in the HEROES Act that should be taken up by the Senate is to make sure that there are 
eviction protections right now. Economically, our community is still gonna be struggling and we need to make sure that whether it's mortgages or rents, that they're given the time or if not the resources to buy time for them to more adequately uh, respond to these challenges. So there is a list, uh, you can go to the Unidos US website and see the various policy issues that we have been uh, formulating to be addressed, both in the context of the present administration, but you know, we haven't even touched on DACA and the fact that we still have um, so many in our community who are at risk of being deported right now based on an administration and a president that has not just threatened to do those, so, but has acted to deport our uh, dreamers. There's a list, there's a number of priorities. We are gonna be at the forefront of leading a lot of that policy engagement. And our hope is that we'll be able to have a chance to do that uh, as we see our community involved and participating in historic ways in the election process. I may add to uh, what Janet said that uh, something, uh, again, going back to our sector, um, we have demonstrated that we can be able to do a lot with very little, but that doesn't need to continue. Uh, we know that in the last economic recession, a lot of nonprofit organizations, community uh, uh, Latino-led, Latino survey organizations did not survive the economic downturn in the mid of the 2000s. So we need to make sure that this sector, our sector is healthy. We need to continue to eliminate the barriers to funding to organizations that are in community. Many of the contract, government contracts are so difficult, so difficult to uh, reach our communities because the communities, uh, the organizations representing these communities have no capacity or, or the resources or the, or the training to be able to access this. In New York City, we piloted a new program, a groundbreaking program, the Nonprofit Stabilization Fund for uh, communities of color. So this is demanding the city of New York being able to allocate funding to make sure that these organizations in good times and in bad times have our in increasing their capacity and be able to be more stable to when COVID-19 hits, that they are there to serve these communities. But we need to do more for our communities of color for these organizations. So uh, Janet, uh, Unidos, and many other organizations, the Hispanic Federation, we have been providing funds uh, emergency funds for our members, for uh, these organizations, but we need to continue investing in them. We need to, to replicate the examples that we have done in Central Florida, what we have done in Puerto Rico, what we have done across the country to make sure that these organizations are better prepared. But again, we need to uh, uh, make sure that federal, state, local funding are hitting those communities that are the affected the most. This cannot be equal for everybody. And we need to ensure that funding reflects, again, the faces of this pandemic. So Hector, you had a couple of, conclu of the concluding question that, that you offered to Manuel, right, about what, how do we move forward? Do you wanna ask it again? Yeah, let me, let, let's, uh, let's present that question and see if we can, uh, if we can bring this bring this home. So the question that I presented to Manuel, again, within the broader context of the complexity and the challenges of the times that we're living in as a society, as a Latino community, as, as minorities in the U.S., um, what is one sentiment that you can leave us with that will help us focus on the light at the end of the tunnel, however faint that light may seem at any given point in time? So we'll start with you, Janet. Sure. I'd say there's probably a couple of things, but I would say first and foremost, again, if there's a silver lining in all of this and we need to use this new revelation of, of what we've seen behind COVID-19 and its impact on our community, and I hope that is that there's finally an understanding that Latinos and immigrants uh, are the essential workers. They're the ones who are putting food on the table 
caring uh, for our sick, caring for our children, for the elderly, and on the front lines of this pandemic, they have been of service to this country in keeping it going during this crisis moment, and that they are essential to the well-being of all Americans, and that we will be moved by that as a country to do what is fair and just, and that is to support those individuals who are filling that important role and give them the assistance that they need regardless of their status. They are fulfilling essential work that is keeping this country going. We need to do our part as a country and honor that work. We need to honor that. That is consistent with our values as a country. And I would say secondly that, um, as others have said, that my hope is that out of all of this, we're seeing not just a moment, but a movement. And, um, you know, with this racial justice lens, capitalize on what we're seeing as the opportunity to see change. We've all seen the demonstrations, the protests. I've participated in those, and I've been moved and inspired by the multiracial, multiethnic, multigenerational uh, engagement that we've seen in this. But I see hope in the actual changes that we're starting to see. Not nearly enough yet, but the fact that you've got the flag in Mississippi that now will finally be changing and re, you know removing the Confederate uh, symbol, NASCAR removing the Confederate flag from its events, the fact that we've seen local governments remove chokeholds and other police excessive practices and seeing a more openness to looking at how we provide law enforcement with a new lens, with community and, and public-based uh, 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 organizations to provide more assistance in that way. We're actually seeing localities change the way that they do that now. We still need the Justice in Policing Act that has passed the House to pass the Senate, but I'm encouraged by the fact that we've already seen some changes that we probably thought were unthinkable. Lastly, the, the name of the Washington National Football Team uh, is changing. And that's after, in caps, the owner said, never. We're seeing people who have thought that things would never happen, happen. That should give us all hope. And for our Latino community, we have to be right in that mix of demanding that change and that respect for our community. Thank you, Janet. Frankie? Um, I'm still angry. I'm still sad. I, 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 what we have witnessed in the last uh, few months have been unbearable. And we just need to continue pushing, as Janet said, and we just need to fill out that damn census and we need to register to vote and we need to come out in November. I, I cannot tell you how much I worry about my family in Puerto Rico. I cannot tell you how much I worry about uh, our people in all different communities around the United States. I, I, need, I need to see that we are going, that these two, 32 million of us are going to get out and vote and decide who is going to represent us. And not only for ourselves, for our families, but for the 28 million people who are Latino and they are unable to vote. So uh, my message is that we need to continue, as Janice said, we need to continue this momentum. We, we have seen things in, my, in these uh, few months that we were never uh, able to imagine uh, a few months ago, uh, but we need to, we cannot get complacent, we cannot get distracted, we cannot allow the infection rates to, 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 to give us more, to, to get us scared. We just need to just do it. It's so easy, it's so easy. They can call us, they can call Unidos, you can uh, get all the information that you need, we just need to continue pushing that. 
just being angry on social media is not enough. We need to fill out that census. We need to get out and vote. And I would just say, in adding on to Frankie, is that he sees this in his member organizations. I see this in our affiliates. Truly, what's giving me hope is seeing how these organizations are responding in this moment to the immediate needs of our community. And they're trying to position themselves to be there for the longer term. We need to respond to them. I see a few of them are on as participants in this chat. And I think about uh, San Isidro Health Center and Ana Malgosa and the work that they're doing right on the border in the, in the California and South, Southern California. I mean, there's example after example of how so many of these nonprofits are stepping up but they need our support because they're responding and they have the trust of the community uh, and they can be the best responders in this moment. So I'm inspired by the work of our affiliates as I know Frankie is by his member organization. So I just wanna say thank you to them. I know they're doing everything they can and we wanna be there for them. We should be there for them as a country because they're responding to such important needs right now. Hector, do you mind if I respond to your question too? I would love that. In, in a way, I'm in both the hopeful place that Janet is and in the sort of angry, still grieving place that Frankie is. Um, my, my family's been affected by this virus and not everybody made it. And we haven't hit the bottom yet. We know that there's gonna be a lot more suffering and we know our community is at the forefront of that suffering. And it is hard not to, not to focus in on all of that. Um, but at the same time, this crisis has laid bare a lot of what we already knew were the ways in which we had failed each other as a society. But it, and, and it has made it visible to people who could, didn't see it before. I think the people on this, certainly the presenters on this call understood it because that's the work that you do. But the country hasn't understood it. And I think, I think we have new access to the information now. I think most Americans now understand who's an essential worker and understand that 40% of these are folks who don't get paid a living wage. They understand a little bit more what it takes for a farm worker to, to, to harvest the food, which then somebody transports to the grocery store and somebody either packs up to be delivered to you or is the, you know, the cashier behind the plexiglass when you check out. I think we have a greater awareness of who people are and the ways in which we have failed them as a society. And I hope what that means is that we're not gonna have a conversation of building back to where we were before because where we were before is not sufficient. I hope it gives us an opportunity to talk about how we build an economy that actually works for everybody. Um, and I, I believe in our community, we, can, we are positioned to be at the forefront of that conversation and that's where we should be. Um, and so that's where I take some hope is that we this, everything has broken open now and we don't have to go back to where it was. We are not, this isn't about just hitting rewind. This is about getting somewhere else that, that is better than we were before. And that's, that's what I take out of both this conversation and, and out of this moment. But Hector, you um, uh, hosted this event. I wanna give you the final word with our thanks to you and to google.org for, for your support. Thank you, Cecilia. Thank you to all of you for participating in this conversation. Um, I'm also walking out of this hopeful. I'm walking out of, this, out of it hopeful because, like Frankie said, I think we have to leverage our anger and our discomfort to be centered in righteousness and our pursuit of justice. So we have to be constantly anchoring ourselves and leveraging that anger to turn it into drive and to continue to push us forward. We have to be like Janet said, not seeing this as just a moment, but as a movement and finding inspiration in that. Like Cecilia said, uh, you, leveraging the awareness of this moment in time and seeing the people that have been in the margins for so long and using this as an opportunity to reset and as an opportunity to build an economy that is more inclusive and has more of a level playing field for everyone. And like uh, Professor Pastor said, uh, how do we keep ourselves anchored on the immediate need to think long term. So that's my challenge to everyone on the call. That's my challenge to all of us as leaders in the Latino community. And I remain hopeful because of people like you. So thank you guys so much for participating. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for being with us today.